Um, and I think yeah, we could we could probably get started. Uh, people are still rolling in, but we have a good a good group here. Um, so I guess uh, the goal of this meeting is basically to make sure we work through all of the spec implementation issues as they come up, um, and that we're all sort of on the same page um, about where, where things are at. Um, we're going to have them weekly for now, um, and we'll see. Uh, as long as they're useful, we can keep them at that cadence. Um, and we might slow them down at some point if we feel like, um, yeah, there's not stuff to discuss every week. Um, and I guess, yeah, the first thing I want to go over, so there's a bunch of open PRs in the specs, and I think it's useful to just understand where they're at, if there's any blockers on them, and, and this way the folks uh, working on client implementations uh, can, can know kind of uh, what to expect and, 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 you know, what to keep an eye out as, as they're working on stuff. Um, so. First one, this one's been open for a while, and I think we basically just have to merge it, but this one is uh, yours, Ansgar, the fee market one. Um, oh, and then Micah left a bunch of comments yesterday. Yeah, so basically, yeah. Yeah, so, so basically I think the, the status was that uh, I don't think there was really any remaining uh, open, open issue. Um, this is my, my first time really actively working on the spec, so I was a little bit hesitant to just, you know, push for, for it being merged, but uh, I think it should, it should basically be ready. But uh, then yeah, yeah, yesterday, Micah left a couple comments. Um, and I think the only one really um, that, that still has to be resolved is uh, I think people disagree around this one constant, which is the the minimum um, um, data, data guess per, per, per blob. Um, so I think basically there are three different positions. The original intent of introducing the constant um, I think that came out of out of some conversations that Vitalik and I had was just to have it basically be a basically normally non non binding lower bound where basically um, the the idea would be that this this would only ever be relevant in case a in the very initial phase of the of the EIP going live there's not yet demand so like a one time kind of kind of just um, 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 a floor or if there ever was some network difficulty or something for, so for some reason for a while there couldn't be any blobs so the price would fall that it doesn't fall all the way down to, to zero or one, basically. Like right now, the, the normal 1559 base fee can go all the way down to seven way. Uh, and then whenever the network would recover, it just takes a while to, to ramp back up to normal levels. If of course, of course you have some floor that normally is irrelevant, but like is hit whenever these conditions happen, uh, that's a bit higher then you kind of your ramp, ramp back up is faster. And, you, and, 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 and that is somewhat relevant because the ramp up period, of course, means that you have like a, a sustained period of just double X um, uh, network load, right? Because uh, you always hit the hit the limit, not the target. Um, uh, and, and we're talking here like an order of an additional 30 minutes or so. So right, and so I think right now, basically the, the ramp up with a constant would be something like 15 to 20 minutes coming from all the way to the floor to some reasonable price level. Uh, without the floor, if you go all the way down to one, basically it would be something more like 45 to 50 minutes. Um, then there are some people who actually want to make this be like a really high floor that is actually binding and kind of has some opinionated approach of, of trying to prevent spam. I personally am very strongly opposed to that just because I think we shouldn't be opinionated uh, what constitutes spam and what doesn't. Um, and then there are people like Michael who very strongly want this constant to be one because they think any anything other than one is, is basically invalid uh, opinion by the protocol. So anyway, this is kind of like one niche last conflict to be resolved, I think. Uh, once that is resolved, the PR should be right to merge. I guess, does anyone on the call have a strong opinion about where this should resolve? So um, so my feeling is this basically. So generally, I mean, I would agree with first, um, I think it's very unlikely in its current form to be a binding constant, like even very soon after um, the whole thing is launched, just because I think there are like, uh, just stupid applications that don't even have to do with blockchains that we would use these. Like this is cheaper than my roaming data fees. So like, let's be honest, it's nothing. Um, okay, so um, the reason, um, and so I think it's unlikely to be really like a problem with spam and practice. The reason why it makes a little bit of sense to like be opinionated in this case um, so where I would contradict Ansgar is that, um, so in a way we are actually subsidizing something here, right? So we are introducing this new thing and um, 
and uh, it is um, it's we 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 don't have a way to scale it just yet, and uh, and so like I think like um, at uh, initially it's very likely that essentially the rest of the Ethereum network is subsidizing this new thing that we're introducing in order to get rollups off the ground. So that's why I think it's actually not crazy to just add a lower bound uh, to that. And the kind of lower bounds that we're discussing are basically still very, very cheap. Um, yeah. Another way to see this, by the way, is that rollups will in practice actually have much higher costs uh, to use this. Like if you look at the um, pre-computation, uh, uh, or as the the precompile, um, it's fifty thousand gas at the moment. Um, so um, in practice, that will be a lower bound, at least for zk rollups. That will be much higher than this. And so you could also uh, argue that it's kind of unfair that um, applications that uh, just want to file share on the Ethereum blockchain or um, uh, I don't know, or store the JPEGs for NFTs on the Ethereum blockchain will have this uh, super cheap data um, because they don't actually need to connect it to the actual blockchain in any way. Um, I'm not super, I don't have a super strong opinion on this. I would prefer raising the current lower limit by about 100x, which would still make it very low in my opinion. Um, and it basically, uh, yeah, would would remove some loud uh, people on Twitter, which I think shouldn't be like our major concern, but I think it's a relatively trivial change. And um, I don't see any downsides. Ansgar, I see you have your hand up again. All right. Um, so, yeah, two things. Uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I, I don't love that approach. I personally, I would prefer, and I think I think there's broad um, support for lowering the 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 target and maximum amount of blobs or in, in, in the case of the updated uh, fee market, basically the, 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 the target and the maximum amount of data gas. And I think that makes a lot of sense basically starting with even something as low as basically uh, one, two or two, four um, as, as, as target max um, for blobs um, and for the, for the first rollout of the EIP. I think that makes a lot of sense and that already basically um, very much limits any impact of potential spend, in, but in an unopinionated way. So I would much prefer that. But as a more kind of like a how to move forward from this. Um, so I'm wondering what we could do is uh, I could I could update the PR to set this constant to one inside the PR, and then we could have a separate PR um, changing changing that and 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 have the discussion over there. So that in, we would remove it as a blocker for for the fee market PR. Would would that make sense? Yeah. And by one, you mean one way, right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. But like, just, just again, like as a, as basically something we're like, okay, now if we want to actually set it to something that would yeah. be an opinionated choice to be made yeah. in a different location. I, I, I would, I think that makes sense. And the thing with one, uh, does the, cause with 1559, we have this weird integer math, which means if it gets below seven, it can't go back up. Do we have the problem with that here? There's no problem uh, with that too. Okay. No, okay. no, we don't. Okay. Because, okay. Yeah, because we have the accumulating. Um, the oh, excess right. Accumulation yeah, yeah, yeah. So that they can keep accumulating, and at some point, it will start impacting. Okay. Yeah, I think I would I would move to do that just because this PR has been open for like over a month. If we can just take out like all the contentious bits, move them to another PR. There's like three other comments by Micah that are just like descriptions. So I think it probably makes sense to just you know uh, the the to resolve those, but the one with the actual constant gets decided, we can just, yeah, have a different PR and, and discuss there. Sounds good to me. Plus one to me, plus one to that. Cool. Anything else on the fee market PR? Um, just, just a quick question on that. It, it, it sounds like um, nothing has of substance has changed since the DevNet was released, at least, or is there something? Were there changes made since? Uh, this is Roberto, by the way. I left a comment saying, um, you know, when I put in the changes, I'm wondering. It, there's been so much back and forth. I've lost track of uh, whether there were any substantive changes since since we, we last implemented it. No, I, I think I think you um, right right when you when 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 the first uh, DevNet with it came out, there were like some last minute changes before then, but that was before DevCon. Yep. Um, 
since then, there have been no substantive changes and, and then none planned. Okay, great, perfect. And it sounds like we're up to date. Thank you. Cool. All right, sweet. So yeah, let's uh, split this one out in two and, and merge uh, the, the actual fee market bit and we can deal with the minimum fee um, yeah, separately. Um, okay, next one. Vitalik uh, had this comment about adding a modulus opcode uh, or modifying the, the pre-compile such that we can, we can take the modulus as an argument. Um, he's not here, but I'm curious um, if anyone has strong opinions on that and if that's something we should be adding to the spec now, uh, because if so, we probably want to notice sooner rather than, than later. This is probably a question that's best for the uh, L2 developers. I don't know if we have many of them on the call today. Right. Yeah, as I understand it, this is more of a user experience improvement and not something that's really necessary for at least L2s in particular. Um, we can deal, like we can just keep track of uh, what the current modulus is across upgrades of uh, 4044 in the future and it's not necessary but it is a nice to have i guess it's like my take on it would it introduce an extra trust assumption where basically now it's it would, would have to be part of layer two governance to uh to update the modulus they use because if not they, they could kind of falsify proofs yeah Sort of like we already do have like specifications that our user rely on, particularly to like make challenges. So it would just be part of that. Whenever L1 makes changes to this, we would make the corresponding change in our specifications and then users can. Yeah, so in a sense, yeah, it would be part of our governance process. I don't think that's a bad thing or it's a blocker in any case. And is this basically used in the same way by optimistic and ZK rollups or is there like a difference in need or, or requirements on, on this front? Wouldn't you need this though, if you wanted to eventually uh, freeze updating of your contracts? Is it only Mofi? Are you only are you, are you always going to be in a state where you'll be able to kind of make these changes whenever uh, there's an update to say the version hash? Ideally, we should, but it will be much easier if um, if the if L one just handled that. Uh. Yeah, I mean, like the, the, that's a nice thing about thing about being able to access the modules from L1. If we can do that, then uh, we could at some point have rollups that uh, don't need any upgradability functionality, but uh, can add the update to a new version hash, which would be really cool. Yeah. How um. Is it possible to say add this in the next hard fork? So say we add, say we implement four yeah, yeah. as is. It can we? Be. Yeah, can we? But there's also there would also be a very simple change to four eight four four, which is to simply make the point evaluation precompile return the modulus in addition to the result. Or take like it in a cost. as a parameter and fail. If or it's that in yes. Uh, well then, yeah, I guess you could do that. But then you would also need you always like where does the contract that calls it get that value? So if it if uh, it returns it, it yeah, if it returns it on like a successful evaluation, um yeah. that seems like a small change now. Yeah. Um and I assume that's not something we could do in a separate hard fork. Like basically, uh, right. yes. Yeah, that yeah, would be, you don't... So it would be good to do it now, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. Is this like mm. literally like a one line change in the, I don't have a feeling for like, is this a value that's already being used as part of evaluating the precompile or is there more work to like expose it as the output? 
it is or it, it is already being used in the pre-compile yeah so that is just a question of like exposing that as a return value while you're making that call is that right yeah yeah and um, just to, to briefly come come back to kind of the question of whether to take it in or return it though um conceptually it seems cleaner to me to 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 have it in as an input value because the point of evaluation pre compile already uh takes in an, an external proof that has to be provided from from outside so basically we just in a way it was we just extend the the proof format to also include the, the, the modulus correct um, but it would mean that the proof size goes up from 48 to um 80 bytes so is that i mean is that, that is a correct, good yeah. idea that seems like why like it just seems like a some useless data that you have to pass in now every time but um isn't it the same as if, if it is returned? Well, for returns, it, I mean, it's just some value in your memory, right? Like if you don't do anything with it now, I, I assume that 90% of contracts for now will not care. This is really for the hardcore. I want to make non-upgradable contracts, which will probably come even like in one or two years at the earliest. Um, and, uh, and only they would actually read this value from memory and the others can simply ignore it, right? Like you don't have to do anything just because some value is in memory. So it seems like yeah. this is less invasive as a change. Of course, it also doesn't, could be an argument doesn't change. To, yeah. It, it could be an argument to be made that we kind of want to encourage trustless architectures. Um, so making it more explicit might but but yeah maybe but, that's but you know, adding extra cost also seems like a stupid thing i mean what you're suggesting yeah. adds an extra cost for everyone no but that's okay. not right right because smart contracts that just trust that could, could just hard code um like that they don't want to mm -hmm. be future proof right. just hard code the value and then yes just upgrade but their for the others contract. it adds that for the others it adds that cost whereas if they return it then they can simply use the return value and feed that to their zero knowledge proof verification. No, but you still need from the outside someone to basically say we we expected the modulus to be this. No. Can you check whether that well we do currently have like assertions that um, each point provided to the precompile like fits in the modulus. So either way Yes, that's a that's a different yeah. thing. That's independent. No, I'm I'm contradicting what Anska says. No, you do not need some external oracle telling you this modulus. Like it's simply Yes, you do need it for the proof, but the contract would only get a proof, would, well, I mean, a proof for the pre-compile, a Zenoid proof for the roll-up state update, and uh, they would, uh, um, and they would feed that modulus into the witness, sorry, not the witness, the public inputs for the roll-up update proof. And so if you get it from the contract, then no, you never need to pass it in from the outside. This data does not need to get into the go to the call data. Okay, then I So yes, I, what I, I'm I suggesting agree. is a is a real efficiency improvement. I mean maybe tiny. I don't know what the other costs are. They are very likely to be much larger. But anyway. So I guess for say we, we went with that, is it worth it for somebody to draft a PR to the EIP? about like basically what it would look like uh, in the EIP and, and like the how also L2s would, would use it. Um, and then we can discuss like the PR async and, you know, make a decision in the next week or two if we want to merge it. But it seems like clearly this is at least worth considering. And I think if we had a specific PR against the EIP, we can share it like not just with optimism, but with the other L2 teams and, and just get feedback on that before we, we merge it. Um, yes, uh, let's do that. Yeah. Denkrad or Ansgar, does either of you have the bandwidth to like do that? Oh, Ansgar has a thumbs up. Nice. Um, oh. That was just for the idea, but I, I, oh. yeah, I, I, I well, do you like? I'm I'm not so sure. I'm I'm tuned in very much to give a lot of motivation, so I, I can do the, oh. the actual spec change. But um, on the motivation side, I'm not yeah. super tuned in. Denkrad, can you help with that? Yes, sure. Okay. 
Okay, sweet. So then create an NSCAR. And then, um, yeah, we can just uh, put it in front of the different LT teams, get some feedback on it. And if it's a small change, then we can include it in the next couple of weeks. Um, sweet. Uh, okay, next one. Uh, Terrence had an update on uh, the sync specs. So basically, um, the idea. I believe we discussed in DevCon was uh, we couple blobs and blocks for kind of gossip and, and quote unquote recent sync, but then we decouple them for historical sync. Um, yeah, I see there's some conversations on the PR. I think at DevCon, everyone was pretty much on the same page here. Any other thoughts, comments on this? With. So the um, one thing with that I was still curious about is whether we're still planning to sign the blob sidecar. I think that was a little up in the air. Like if we're going to gossip them together, then RPC, we don't necessarily need to do the signature verification. Um, and if the blocks have references to blobs inside them, then the signature of the block would in theory be enough, maybe. Uh, Proto? So I did discuss this change um, with Danny and others at DEFCON. Um, it's indeed, we can do it either way. We don't need the signature. It's mostly a performance thing where verifying the signature might be cheaper than verifying the commitment. And so if we don't want to allow spammers to like give us lots of different bad data, then maybe it's better to have a signature to check first before then verifying the commitments. But I want to like hear some numbers from people that benchmark this type of thing. Otherwise, I'd rather just simplify the protocol and remove the signature. And how should we benchmark this exactly? I think someone here working on libraries might already have numbers on like just the cost comparison of verifying the commitments that come with a blob sidecar versus just verifying a single B1 signature. I think it's strongly in favor of the BOS signature there. I'm just not sure if it's significant enough like to be a, a kind of dose factor or if you like want it one way or the other. Got it. Um, and I guess, yeah, we want to keep this PR open until we have that. Okay, and yeah, I see you basically have a comment thread about that in the PR. Um, and Terence was saying he doesn't think we need the signature for the sidecars, right? Um, right, we can verify the sidecar matches the, the beacon block itself just by verifying the commitments. Yeah. The commitments verification cost is the main concern. On the execution client side, I think we got comfortable with doing that signature verification or the commitment verification. It was something like three to four milliseconds per commitment verification. Is there any reason why we'd expect it to be different on the consensus side? Sorry, just saying, can you uh, repeat the question? Oh, I was just saying on the on the execution layer, we got comfortable from a DOS perspective doing the KDG commitment verification. And I'm just wondering whether there's anything different about this uh, on the consensus side that would make us get to a different answer in terms of instituting the BLS signature as a workaround. Um, basically, in, so for execution, we're one with the approach of uh, just announcing transaction hashes. So the client has the, um, I guess the client is free to pull them whenever. And if it becomes like a DOS issue, they can start disconnecting peers. In consensus, we don't have this luxury, 
because we couple the sidecar with the beacon block. And if we think the beacon block is valid and the proposer is valid and whoever's sending them are valid, then we would always, like in the worst case, always attempt to verify the sidecar. So we don't get to choose, or at least we're not, we don't, we're not as flexible as execution to like choose to whether or not to verify sidecars or not. I mean, it's still attributable to the pair if the sidecar that comes with the beacon block cannot be matched against that beacon block. So it's probably fine to remove the signature and just rely on the commitment check. Yeah. Okay. Can someone just comment on the PR after this call so Terence knows like of this discussion and can probably make the changes on it? I think the PR already removed oh, it, so we just okay. continue nice. with PR SS. Okay. Anything else we wanted to change or discuss on that PR specifically? Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, oh, yeah. one last thing. I did have like a comment on the PR and uh, how exactly we want. Um, um, one sec. How exactly we want to um, sort of like gossip those the couple blocks and sidecars like what are we doing with the old topic um is it is it going to be deprecated from now on or is it still going to be used it wasn't quite clear to me how we go forward from with this i left a comment on the pr so okay. we can always discuss that async as well i don't think we should keep the old uh, topic around with only the blobs or only the beacon blocks. We should just have one topic. The whole reason to couple them is for consistency. And by creating more topics, we only create, or we keep the edge case that we wanted to get rid of. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Cool. Um, I had another question. Um, I'm not sure if there is a comment about this on the PR, but since we're gonna couple blobs and gossip, then are we thinking of like more tightly coupling the blocks and blobs in like the execution engine beacon node API? Um, because like, obviously you'll need both to broadcast anything. With the engine API, there's an expectation that the engine always has the blobs that match the block that is being produced. So even if there's an inconsistency, it should be trivial to get the blobs. Whereas on a peer-to-peer, -peer, you might have an entirely different mesh of pairs per gossip topic. And so you don't have this guarantee that the data is there. So, so, so you can, we could, like, we we could couple like, them, but we don't really have to. Okay. And for now, I think it's nice to just stay compatible with the existing API. Okay. Instead of introducing a new version of the method. Yeah. Anything else on this PR? Okay. And then Terence had another one basically proposing uh, 18 days. Uh, to uh, to keep the blobs, um, you know, based on some conversations we had at DevCon, like it seemed like two weeks was the upper bound that everyone felt comfortable with. I suspect 18 days maps, yeah, it maps to a, a neat number of epochs. Um, yeah, does anyone have a strong opinion about this or disagree? At the very least, does anyone uh, does anyone think it should be longer? I know some people were arguing for even shorter, um, but I think I, I haven't heard anyone argue that it should be longer. So if not, I think we can probably just merge this change. And if we want to make it even shorter, we, we can do that in the future change. 
Okay, I will take silence as a yes. Uh, so all that parents know. And then so, the last, oh, sorry, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I was just generally wondering about like, what's like, why 18 days, I guess? Like, is it supposed to just encapsulate like the longest fraud proof periods we might imagine? Or is it supposed to like set, like it would be like a precursor to how long you need to retain data in full sharding for like proof of custody or something like that? Or like, is it supposed to be longer than the week subjectivity period or? Right, as I understand it, it's um, the longest fault proof. And, you know, say you were like not on, say you were like not online, you had to like sync a new node from scratch and you wanted to participate or retrieve some data, um, two weeks felt like that. And then the other thing was as well, say there was a weird consensus issue um, that happened on, on mainnet. And for some reason to resolve this consensus issue, we wanted to have blobs still live on the peer-to-peer -peer network. Two weeks is the period where we generally think we can solve pretty much any issue on Ethereum. Um, so it gives us like some, some, some room there. Um, yeah. Uh, cool. Thanks. Yeah, but it's a very yeah, it's it's a very uh, soft uh, metric. There's not like a, a hard requirement. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I think we can all agree. 18 days is an upper bound. We can change the spec to that, and um, uh, yeah, go from there. And then the storage requirement, like a uh, uh, Prism said. Uh, at one meg target, this would be 137 gigs. It's extremely likely that we have a target that's like well below that. Um, so less less than 100 gigs, I, I would say. Um, sweet. Okay, so those are all the actual spec changes for 4844. Oh, sorry. Quick, just quick, going back up one on the... Um coupling beacon box and bobs is there an, uh, like an action item there just don't want to follow up with terence just to like give him a nudge that we discussed it and decided on it yeah that was what i was planning to do um, okay, you're, you're on that as well. okay yeah yeah I'll, I'll, I'll let him know and, and then I'll, I'll send him this recording as well so he can have the, the context of the conversation i think he's probably the best person to just move those prs forward yeah um sweet okay so the next one um Basically, this one's like a bit tricky where um, the idea of like, how do we rebase 4844 on Capella? Um, Tim, did we miss the, do we want to talk about the oh, cryptography? API oh, sorry. One? Yes, actually, yes. I didn't miss that one. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Uh, the, okay. Yeah, this is uh, George's PR about uh, the cryptography API. Um, yeah, sorry. Uh, so I saw, yeah, there were some reviews on that one. I think Roberto, you added it to the agenda um, and you had some questions recently on the PR. Um, so yeah, do you want to take a minute to walk us through where, where things are at? Yeah, I don't know if I had any particular opinions on it. I just wanted to make sure it was everyone was aware of it. It was, it was non-contentious. It looks fairly straightforward to me. Yeah. Um, thank God I see you were part of the yeah, reviews a few days ago uh sure sorry what what's the question um i guess anything outstanding on this uh the pr by george about the cryptography api update and the fiat shamir logic so i believe it well so, okay so it is ready um there's one very small question on whether we need domain separators and uh, Dimitri will still look into that, but um, the change for that will be trivial. And actually there are already placeholder variables for that. So it would simply assigning value to these placeholders. And uh, even if libraries don't implement them as they are, which uh, the change is still trivial. So um, I think we should merge that PR and then maybe, uh, yeah, like Dimitri will still tell us whether he thinks we should add those. Okay, sweet. And I guess, uh, okay. and I guess, yeah, Kev was also having a look. So, uh, opinion Kev, making sure, I don't think Kev is here, right? Yeah. 
no. So Peter and Kev. Um, uh, yeah. Oh yeah. He, oh, you are. Sorry. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I agree with Dan Credit. It's just the domain separators that are the main problem. Uh, and I guess, do we expect to like have an update on that in the next few days, or is it something we're going to need more time to determine? Um, I don't know about the next few days. I'd have to ask Dan Crad about Dimitri's availability. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's not a blocker to the actual uh, PR. And uh, it's only a blocker if we want test vectors, fixed test vectors. But... Right. And I guess, yeah, the, and the reason I'm asking is just like, if there's client teams that are looking into implementing it, should they just basically look at this PR, assume it to be part of the spec? effectively and it seems like we're saying yes yeah exactly but there okay. are there's ckzg and a few libraries around that sort of uh, just implement it and client teams just need to uh, look at the public facing api which won't change okay okay that's it okay perfect so okay so for the client team's perspectives it's it's uh, abstracted by the library and then the work to implement this would be in ckzg basically right Okay. Sweet. Anything else on this PR? Is there a person who's going to own merging that? Yeah. It, yeah but it, it, by the way, as of now, I don't think all that logic is in GoKGZ. I think a lot of it is in the clients. We're moving pieces of it over little by little, but it's not quite there yet. Yeah. I forked your. Uh... Go Ethereum branch, and uh, I was modifying the API. Uh, I just haven't pushed the PR yet. I pushed one to Prism uh, in fees branch, but not to yours yet. Uh, Proto? Oh, sorry, Roberto. Do you want to go and then Proto? Okay. I, I mean, I, I, I'll have to take a look at that PR. I haven't seen it yet, but that's, that's great. Cool. Uh, Proto, yeah. I do think GoKCG has the necessary methods, but they're not as nicely grouped together as here. Um, it, we merged the PR that upstreams the evaluate polynomial in evaluation form. So I think we're complete now. Maybe I'm missing another method. I'll take a look, I'll take a look. If, I, if we're missing anything, I'll let you know. Um, there was an actual issue that I uh, opened up yesterday that um, I think GoKVG needs to basically check that, uh, remove the check that uh, field elements are non are canonical. Um, if I, I think the issue is 3037, uh, 3057. Um, so okay, I think that's the only that. thing. Yeah. Is there any particular reason why we need to remove validation? Uh, yeah, so if I remember correctly, Murphy said that uh, for the when a blob is canonical, it's not up to the cryptography to decide uh, whether a blob should be canonical. It's up to the person that's encoding the data. Specifically, if the, the data, data is, is out of range, like, if the field, like the, the bytes have a value that does not fit in a field element, shouldn't it just be invalid? Yeah, that's the point I was trying to make. The data is allowed to be um, out of range. It's whatever the output of the encoding that should be basically fit in the field element. And Kev's point was that there are cases where you could have different data mapping map to the same um, encoding. Well, I guess it all depends on the coding. In, the, in that scenario, I would argue that the coding is invalid and useless and incorrect. But the point was the cryptography shouldn't be able to verify that the data was encoded correctly because that's all up to the user. We can still have like the field element checks, you know, to make sure that it's it fits within the modulus, but um, the data itself, it's not its not something we can check because it's already encoded, if that makes sense. So I would say that if the user wants specific data to be 
sell it with respect to the crypto functions, then they can just apply the modulus or cut off the the bytes that are or the bits out of bounds. It like there are many ways to map like data to some point in a like a specific integer range. I'm not sure if we should create an expectation that people can just encode data however they like outside of this range and then still compute commitments over it. Yeah, I agree. Was that, was that, did that make sense, Kev? Um, I just make sure that we're in the same picture. Uh, yeah, I, I understood it as Proto was agreeing with what I was saying, but uh, you agreed as well, so I'm a bit unsure. Uh, but we can take it offline. I can post the link to the issue as well here. Okay, anything else on the, on the PR? Okay, um, I think that was it for all the you know proper spec changes. Um, we have this draft PR by Mofi about rebasing 4844 on Capella. And I guess uh, the background here is that the current DevNet uh, kind of implement 4844 over Bellatrix and uh, I think the the sort of rough consensus we had reached is that it makes more sense to have this rebase on top of Capella instead. Um, and and uh, but then that means it, it might be tricky to do some of the testing while Capella is not fully implemented in all of the clients. Um, so yeah, Mofi, do you want to take a minute and walk through like what your PR proposes? Yeah, it really doesn't propose much anymore. The original draft basically rebased 4.4.4 and Capella, but added introduced a feature flag to disable Capella specific state transitions. Um, based on feedback in the PR, I think we can we shouldn't try to enshrine such flags in the spec. So the latest revision basically removes that. It's simply rebased on Capella, but there is a section at the bottom of the spec for testing that outlines the uh, necessary functions we want to stub out for EIP 4844 specific testing. That way we retain the Capella con um, containers and concepts, but no withdrawals or withdrawal interaction actually happens when testing EIP 4844. Got it. And so that basically means that Capella is a sort of like no op fork that happens and the clients run through it, but then, yeah, they, they, they don't have to have withdrawals implemented in order to test the 444 changes. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm still I, not sure if, um, I guess it depends on like client teams implementation and how their code bases are structured. Um, I'm not 100% sure if this would be feasible, depending on how like client teams implement those functions that I've outlined to be stubbed. Right. Also, this doesn't solve the issue of, um... yeah, I don't know. I, I guess we'll find out during testing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, so I guess, yeah, um, there's a couple of client team uh, contributors on the call here. I think if you all can review this, PR, that would be great. And I think um, we should definitely bring it up on the CL call uh, next week as well, so that it gets the attention of like all the different client teams there, um, if, if it hasn't in the meantime. Yeah, um, I'm from White House. I would generally say that like, we really support this because um, having like the consensus objects in the EIP 4844 fork, look like what they're actually going to look like will like on net reduce a lot of work for us because otherwise if we have like a 4844 without withdrawals um like fork i guess and a just capella fork without 4844 and then like um this new set of consensus types that might be 
the most uh, like accurate in the future. This sort of equates to us having su to support three different forks. Um, so if like if we know withdrawals are going to be included, then this change, yeah, reduces work for us by like eliminating a fork essentially. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, for Teku, we're we're not opinionated. We do all of our development on on main behind feature flags, so we don't have fork issues. So it I, either way is fine um, on that. Sweet. And then Dan, you said, yeah, you've managed to implement it this way on Lodestar. Um, and Terence is aware of this because he's commented on a PR. So maybe, uh, what's the other client? Uh, yeah, just maybe getting Nimbus to have a look at this um, would be good. And then, yeah, it, it seems like if Nimbus doesn't have like a strong objection to this, we could, we could probably move forward. Um, so anything else on this? And I guess, yeah, the assumption here is like any interop testing and whatnot we would do moving forward would likely be, you know, using this format of like a stub capella, um, which is different than what we've used for the DevNets uh, historically. Okay. Um, okay, next up, yes. Uh, one thing I just want to check in on. So um, for the KZG libraries, um, we obviously we have CKZG, there's bindings being developed in Go. Um, are we, is anyone aware of like a client team that for whatever reason can't use any of the libraries that are being developed? Um, or that needs, you know, specific bindings or something that like does not exist? uh for them yet uh, i don't think rust bindings exist yet but i know there's a couple of people interested in working on them okay so rust bindings for uh kcg library likewise i think oh. for name Oh, sorry. Uh, I was saying, I, I think the same situation for NIM. Um, right. So NIM and Rust both need bindings after the KZG library. And there's a question for Nethermine. Uh, oh, okay. So there's progress as well on a .NET, but it's not there yet. Okay, so we have .NET in progress, Rust and NIM missing, but then every other client team is is fine. Yeah, uh, on .NET side, we just need to update according to the new peer, which includes simplification of the API, and uh, we will integrate like that. We do, do not use uh, old API version. We want to use the new one. Sweet. Anything else on the KZG libraries? And we, I guess, yeah, we can figure out offline um, for the Rust and, and, and Nimbus implementation how to best get those done, unless someone has wants to volunteer for them here. Oh, and it seems there is a Rust library in progress. Um, Okay, um, I guess next thing I want to cover, like uh, there's a bunch of different client teams here. Um, I'm curious to hear just generally where teams are at with their implementation and if they have any blockers or things that you know they think everyone else should be aware of. Um, yeah. Um, I guess I'll, I'll go from the order uh, I see on the video. Dan, I see you've started like a, a Lodestar pull request. That's right. Um, yeah, it's all going fine in Lodestar. There's a bit of a question about how we're going to uh, use CKZG 
we need to generate TypeScript bindings, but I'll figure that out when I get there. Um, I'm basically up to the networking. So I have all the types and uh, params and config in there. Um, hopeful that I can get the networking and then the blob verification done this week. Um, okay, just going through the list. Ben, any updates from the Teku side? Yeah, we've barely started uh, on this yet. Um, in the next couple of weeks, we'll we'll get off the ground. But uh, uh, yep, it shouldn't be a huge lift, I think. Sweet. Um, Mofi. Um, uh, not much uh, work since the uh, I guess the DevNet, which is still based on Bellatrix structs. Um, actually, Terence is uh, has a branch on EIP four four four, and I think we want to like start moving development to his branch because okay. it contains like the latest Capella structures, and um, basically it's more in sync with uh, Prism upstream. Nice, uh, Sean. Yeah. So since DevCon, we've mostly been focusing on. Um, essentially Mofi's PR to rebase 4844 on Capella. Um, and then Pawan's also been working on unifying the gossip topics. Um, and I think we're, we're pretty far along. So we're hoping to join the next testnet um, with uh, like the Capella structs as well. Um, yeah, it's, it's about it for, from us. Cool. Uh, Jerry? No, we didn't start working on it yet. I'm assuming after today's planning, we will start. Sounds good. Um, so this. Oh, we didn't hear you. You came off mute, but we didn't hear anything. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I, I was mo mostly working on um, guiding the uh, tries to to work on that kzg library uh, so i would say we probably will not start much on the client side until we have a bit uh, uh, more work done on the kzg library uh, i think so we'll join a bit later got it um alexei uh yeah uh we have work in progress. Uh, it's quite uh, important for us to have some milestone. I mean, what should be on uh, DevNet 3, like that. And uh, we will uh, align to that. And uh, uh, the idea is to join this network and uh, provide some functionality. But uh, I'm not aware of, of what uh, certain peers will be included. What do you want guys to see there? Uh, like that. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I was going to sort of finish up with the third DevNet. I feel like next week we should probably spend most of the call on that. Like this week, there's, I think, a bunch of open issues that we need to clean up and, and, and get merged into specs. And then I think in next week's call, we should be able to say like, hey, you know, this is basically the scope for the next DevNet. Um, does, that, does that make sense? I suspect... Yeah, Every great. team has at least one week of work of work to get at least a, like the basic full implementation and rebase on Capella. Oh, okay, this rebase is a bit disturbing for me just because it's new for me because uh, we have uh, withdrawals implemented like uh, part of Shanghai fork as far as I remember. And probably if we will rebase, uh, it will cause some issues for us, maybe. I need to check. Right. Yeah. So I think if teams should definitely look at like rebasing all the 444 stuff on top of Shanghai or Capella. Um, and then, you know, all the PRs we, we kind of discussed today. But then I think next week we'll be in a spot where we have like, we're able to more crisply define these are the sets of, of things we want to hit, if that, if that makes sense. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Sweet. Thanks. Uh, Roberto? Uh, yeah, I've just started looking into Aragon. I'm going to be um, working on that through the next week. Nice. I haven't made a lot of progress yeah, yet, right. though. Nice. 
And I think Marius, you're the other one. Sorry, I didn't hear you. Oh, uh, sorry, I was just, I think Marius is the only other person working on a client implementation now. Uh, oh, are you still here, Marius? Connecting the audio. Yes. Hello. Um, yeah, I, uh, we're working on a bunch of other stuff at the moment. Uh, so we don't really have a stable withdrawal branch that we could rebase on top. Um, I'm kind of, today I started looking into the, the BLS uh, Go bindings for Go. Uh, for CKZG, um, that's going okay. There's a bunch of issues with it right now. Um, but uh, yeah, so regarding withdrawals, as I said, it's uh, we don't have the normal withdrawal functionality in the code yet. We have a branch, but I'm not sure how far along that one is. So, got it. Any anyone else working on a client implementation that I missed? Okay, we have about a minute to go, but um, I wanted to make sure we also cover this. Um, one of the big things we're working on for testing is this idea of uh, having a large, uh, large blocks that we send full of call data on the network and see how the network handles those as a way to gauge, um, you know, our are blobs viable from a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, perspective? Um, Dan, do you want to take a minute or two and talk through where things are at there and, and what are like the, the next steps? Yep. Yeah. Um, sorry, for the, for the big block experiment? Yes. Yeah, uh, so we're just trying to figure out um, kind of like the logistics of actually how we would submit, how, how do we actually fill up these blocks with two megabytes of data? So I think we've found um, there, there's some issues with mempool propagation. If you try to submit like a really large transaction, um, thinking maybe try MEV boost, but the issue is that that's extra integration work and not all validators run MEV boost. Um, so I think the latest suggestion was um, from Tim to um, try to submit to validators directly. So I don't know exactly how we would do that, but um, yeah, just, just Literally figuring out how to actually make sure we get, you know, the transac our transactions are the ones that are get picked, and um, you know, trying to get as close to the full two megabyte block limit as possible, uh, consistently through in a row. Right, and then, yeah, Maris, this might be a good question for you. So, get limits how much, how big the transactions can be gossiped in the transaction pool. Um, mm, if, yes. So if I don't know to, if we actually. Yeah, Matt confirmed this morning. I think it's 128k. Uh, yeah, we can patch that. Is there? Yeah, is there a way? The definite. Yes. No. So if we want to do this on mainnet, so we want to submit oh. big blocks on mainnet. Yeah. Yeah. You want to submit big blocks on mainnet with call data? Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. We we can we can we can submit big blocks on our local network, but we cannot do this on mainnet. Like cannot this, this, this because no, this, 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 like this, this safety feature is there for a reason. And uh, like tr removing it would be. Yeah, yeah, I'm not saying we, we should remove it from get, but I say, I guess, yeah, and we can, take this offline, but basically um, Stark, Starkware did it a few years ago. How did they do it would be the question that I have. Well, they need to control, you need to control the block producers. Right, okay. But okay, so that's the way, it's like basically send them through either flash bots or through like some staking pool or something yes. like that. We're not I mean, to... you're saying one block producer, right? Well, it depends how, you know how how, how how many you want to do that. Sure, yeah, sure. Um, I see. Yeah. So wait. So okay. So what what is the gas block limit? It's like one hundred twenty-eight k, and 
we would like get does this. not produce blocks larger than 120 uh, transactions okay. transactions so you could do it by sending a bunch of 128k transactions yeah why that not doesn't do that? Yeah. it doesn't guarantee they all get included in the same block right um well, it doesn't guarantee so that but if you bid um a bit more for gas than they should be yeah yeah that might be the that might be the simplest way um yeah, and Zizar, and then we can probably wrap up. Right, I just briefly wanted to say that uh, given that we haven't yet had any post-merge load testing in general, I think this we should be careful, maybe not to immediately start with some megabyte loads, but to kind of slowly ramp up to there. So just, just in case we notice that, you know, even at 500K, the network's already struggling. <laughs> Right. Yes. This should this should this should be a moment to stop. So I I think basically just well, I mean, visual... I I don't see much of a scenario where like this would cause permanent damage to the network. Well, it might just in case <laughs> just because well, attackers like, could just watch this and be like, oh, it it's easy to actually bring down the Ethereum network, you know. Yeah, and it does cause permanent damage because it increases the history. And as long yeah, as we've not look, decided... we are looking, we are talking about a few megabytes. We're not going to add gigabytes to the history. No, no, that's not, this is not a valid argument. Um, so I, I, I don't like. I, I, I think it's not. Uh, I mean, yeah, you could flag that up to someone, sure. But like, I mean, honestly, someone who's, I don't know. Anyway, we need to be resistant to that attack. So I, I, I don't think we have to be that careful. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's going to be fine. Well, but I mean, even temporary network instability, you know, like we, I think we, we all kind of have pretty high reliability standards for mainnet. And so, I don't know. I just, yeah, I personally we, would feel much more com comfortable well, if, if, if it if, was like a multi If it takes a one megabyte blocks to like bring it down, then we're already not satisfying that standard, in my opinion. Yeah. So, yeah. but at the very least, I, yeah, I, I think, think at the very least we can just use vanilla geth, like the so transaction one for us is. Blocks, one megabyte blocks will already bring a bunch of validators down. That's that's just how it is. Like continued one megabyte blocks. Um, there are a lot of validators that don't have the bandwidth require, required for this. And uh, they. I will mean, what is what's a, what's a lot? Sorry. What's a lot? Like one percent or even five percent yeah, does not yeah, affect yeah, maybe network like, quality. Like, yeah. like, let's just be honest. It's not a problem. Fine, they miss some attestation. Who cares? It's nothing. They miss. They they lose a, a cent per attestation. Look, it's not a concern. Like main, mainnet is not going to go down because of this, just because we, we've designed it so that 30% can go offline without anything happening. Sure, but if we can minimize however much we take offline. I, I, don't, I don't get why we, why we need to start testing this on mainnet. Oh, why we don't not? start. Oh, yeah, we won't start on mainnet. No, for sure. Oh, I, I, like, of course well, we could do this. Can do this test in in like a month on mainnet. I I don't, I don't care about this, but like we we shouldn't like. Yeah, start but test nets are not going to tell you anything interesting because everyone runs their test net nodes. On well, you would hope out. that's the thing. So if if this works yeah. smoothly on test nets, then you can move to mainnet. But if we break something on a test net, it's yes. much better to have broken it on a test net first. And so I think sure, sure. My, we're already. I, I feel people are being over cautious here, but yeah, fine. I mean, I think, yeah, we're, we're already over time. It's, My yeah. feeling is like just gradually ramping up the size of things we do seems to be like the best way to go. And like, we probably don't have to deal with this, like being bigger than the get mempool transaction cap for now. Um, even when we move to mainnet, we can probably do like a first test with something like, um, um, yeah, we can probably do a first test with something like a bunch of 128K transactions with like a relatively high priority fee and hope that most of them get in the same blocks. Um, Perry, uh, talking about what metrics we want to track, does it make sense to just move that to next week as well? Because I think, I don't think that, well, first we're sort of out of time, but, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, do you want to take two minutes and maybe talk about it? But I suspect to get a full list, we'll probably need the the chat async. We can we can do 
with async then that's fine okay yeah so let's i guess yeah let's in the next week uh discuss this um in the in, in the telegram group about this if anyone wants to be part of the telegram group talking about this experiment uh reach out to me i'll add you um and then i think next week uh for this call if we can have uh you know the issues we talked about mostly resolved uh, a cleaner spec or target for devnet 3 and then uh, a sort of set of metrics to target for the for the this experiments that would be that'd be really good anything else uh before we wrap up okay yeah thanks everyone um appreciate staying on a couple extra minutes and talk to you all soon thanks everyone thank have you a great day all right thanks tim uh, Thanks, everyone. Bye.